This video has been sponsored by Sentai Filmworks and High Dive. If there's any particular anime you want to watch that just happens to be distributed by Sentai Filmworks like Made in Abyss, No Game No Life, and Rurouni Kenshin New Kyoto Arc, then you should definitely check out this streaming service, High Dive. You can easily use this site on your computer, mobile devices, and even Amazon Fire TV. The subscription is only $4.99 a month, but if you use the link in the description box, you can register for a 7-day free trial. That way, you can give their services a shot at no cost to you. If you're still not sure, you'll at least be given a chance to explore their catalog before signing up and can even watch some of the first episodes for free. This is a neat streaming service I recommend for you all, so click on the link down below, explore their catalog, and sign up for the 7-day free trial for High Dive. Change is not easy, but it's inevitable. I mean, if things never changed, we wouldn't be living the lives we were blessed with today. With the technology we have, the conveniences and leisures we indulge in, and the care we're given to extend our lives could only be seen as a dream for many, and surprisingly, a nightmare for some. You ever look at historical changes at world history and wonder why some people rebelled against what we consider to be a positive change? The short answer is some people don't like change. At all. But for a more broadened example, perhaps we could take a look at one of Japan's most iconic stories of all time, Roroni Kenshin. Special thanks to Joe Lykenberry for requesting this through Patreon, and we're sorry it took this long to review it. Granted, there is a lot to cover with this series since it has how many episodes? And how many OVAs and movies? And that's not even including the live action movies, right? Three! Three live action movies! I'm saving those for later. Japan must really love this story, so let's find out why. To start this review, let's quickly address the history this anime is based on. And <laughs> people say I'm not educational. Not to mention, Kenshin himself is actually based off of a real samurai named Kawakami Gensai, so the more you know. The story is based 11 years after the Meiji Restoration had begun. Before this, however, Japan was in an intense war over power and control between the Shogunate and the Empire. To put things basically, the Empire desired a more westernized government where the entire country and its people would be ruled equally under one faction, while also modernizing their education, medical practices, and political standards, and making their borders open to the entire world. The Shogunate saw this as a betrayal to their country and would thus put an end to Japanese culture as they saw it. So the Boshin War commenced, with the Shogunate losing due to the Empire having more advanced weaponry thanks to their European allies. This would create a new era of peace for the people while welcoming a new wave of education, economic growth, and political stabilization. While on one hand, the people wouldn't be separated by the Shogunate's power and constantly dying in a new war for power, on the other hand, some were concerned with a new era and how fast they were trying to be like other countries, and also skilled individuals like the samurai were no longer useful now that the nation established their first military system. This is just a brief summary of the Meiji Restoration, but if you want to learn more, I have provided some links down below covering the entire history of the Meiji era. The point of the matter is taking this sudden and sensitive change in history and creating a story where our characters had to adjust from one lifestyle to another. Will they welcome peace, reject the new lifestyle, or did something happen to them during the change? Rurouni Kenshin started off as a manga series written by Nobuhiro Watsuki in an attempt to make a shonen series unlike any other. It was first published in Weekly Shonen Jump magazine back in April 1994, and it ran its course until September 1999. Like any other series, the popularity of the manga led to its anime production, so on January 10th, 1996, the first anime of Rurouni Kenshin was released. The first 66 episodes were produced both by Studio Gallup and Studio Dean, but the rest were just produced by Studio Dean. The story itself is much more mature and darker than I ever remembered. It follows the journey of a wandering swordsman named Kenshin Himura. Whenever people see his hair and scar, they acknowledge him as one of the deadliest swordsmen to ever exist, Hitokiri Patosai. 
who also went under the name The Manslayer. The Potosai was seriously skilled in his craft and could take down any opponent without breaking a sweat. However, things are actually different now. Kenshin wields a special blade called the Sakabato, aka the Reverse Blade. This allows him to defeat his enemies using his skills, but the effects will not result in death. For Kenshin has made a vow to never ever take another person's life, no matter the circumstances. This, however, will not be easy as many opponents come forth to turn him back into the Manslayer he used to be, or to actually hire him to kill off any new threats. But with the help of his new friends, Kenshin will stand by his vow and protect the new peace given to everyone. The overall theme to Roroni Kenshin is a complicated mesh between redemption, peace, and defining one's morality. I will say I walked into this series expecting Kenshin to be some Jesus-like persona taking out anyone who threatened peace, but still not killing them. And that's what I was getting at first with the beginning of the first anime. The episodes at the very beginning were bad guy shows up to disturb the peace. Kenshin tells him to stop, don't do that. They don't stop while laughing at his stupid sword. Kenshin uses the sword to stop the bad guy without killing them. Bad guy goes in jail. Kenshin is awesome. But as the show kept progressing, the darker it became with its theme and narration. The bad guys weren't just some stubborn killers wanting to go back to their killing ways like in ye olde days, but were for the most part victims of the changing times. Well, except the last arc. <laughs> Case in point, dear new wave government, you f***ed us all. Badly! Let's put it this way, if you were a skilled soldier fighting for the shogunate in the Meiji era, you'd be executed on the spot for treason. If you were a skilled soldier serving the Meiji Restoration, you'd either join the military, be hired as a bodyguard to protect influential businessmen or politicians, or be forced to retire and never wield a sword again. That or be executed if you were seen as a powerful threat. The Meiji period took back all of the land so all of Japan could be ruled by one nation, so those individuals who were granted land before were screwed over. Not to mention the country was undergoing drastic changes to catch up with the rest of the world, which was a huge no-no to Meiji supporters wanting peace, but for Japan to stick to its roots. There were new people in charge and they had to keep that power no matter who they screwed over, so those actions only humanize our villains. Most of them. Our first examples are two of the main characters we meet named Yahiko and Sanosuke. Yahiko was the son of a samurai while Sanosuke was part of a mercenary army for the shogunate. Both of their lives were turned for the worse as the samurai lost a lot of influence and revenue when the Meiji period began, as there was no longer a use for them, and the army that Sanosuke was part of was thrown under the bus during the Boshin War, which led to most of the soldiers being executed. Both suffered greatly during the new change, but can thank thankfully put their skills to good use thanks to Kenshin's guidance. Then we have the Oniwaban group who used to be spies for the Edo castle but now resort to laying low and taking on simple jobs to protect their clients. However, a good chunk of them were killed as their client decided to prove the point even more that there was no room for swordsmen in this brand new era of guns and technology. That it doesn't matter how skilled you are, those with power and money can have the luxury of taking you out if you have the tools to do it. And then we get to the Kyoto arc where our our heroes had to face a warrior that was meant to replace the Potosai, Makoto Shishio. Due to his power and the leverage he held, the government made a hasty decision to burn Makoto to death, only for him to actually survive, somehow, and create an army to exact his revenge on the Meiji government. Maybe Makoto couldn't be easily negotiated into a military position like others or something like that, but it's no wonder he wants to take down the government. Just burn him alive, what could possibly go wrong? What I'm basically trying to say is Roroni Kenshin perfectly portrays the tension and complications sparked from a move that was supposed to do good for all. It's not a basic good versus evil story, but more on how complicated politics and power struggles can be when humans are ultimately selfish and greedy. The government is never truly painted as the good guys trying to maintain peace when it's their actions that cause a lot of this backlash to occur. Even in one of the later arcs, there are terrorist attacks against political leaders because many years ago, a Christian commune was destroyed with most of the inhabitants executed. 
Oh my god, this anime has an arc featuring the Japanese government versus Christianity. These people just wanted to pray to Jesus and live in peace, but no! Can't be praying to Jesus in this country now. Chokes on them, the Japanese are quite happy celebrating Christmas, thank you very much. <laughs> Case in point, the anime goes all out to show how ugly the Meiji era was at the beginning and that the government was mostly to blame for the retaliation they faced. But even with all of this tension between the past and the present, Kenshin will stand his ground and try to find balance for everyone to see the ultimate picture. He convinces Yahiko and Sanosuke to change their ways and protect peace, convinces Aoshi to give up his prideful attempts to redeem his fallen comrades as his actions are only hurting the ones he cares for, but also convince the government to ease up on the Christian commune and at the very least transfer them to a nation that'll take them so that they won't look like murderous bigots in the eyes of the western world. Many battles were waged over pride and power, but Kenshin was there to bring in some form of balance while trying to maintain the promise of peace. Now that's how Kenshin is ultimately, demonstrating the complications of change when the actions of those making said change are questionable, which only instigated a lot of backlash. With all of this in mind, does the anime portray the narrative well enough? Well, yes and no. The anime itself has severe tone issues. For example... I'll be the first one to get to heaven. Wait, Genta! Don't go over there! I'm gonna go to heaven! Genta! Yahiko, try tasting the food before swallowing it. Yeah, quit eating like a slob. This is why I hate being with kids. You better save some for me. Yeah, one episode they're trying to save a Christian commune from genocide, the next they're in a wacky situation full of hilarity. I guess. How can you do that, though? I think what Roroni Kenshin suffers from the most is shonen-itis. As the writer Nobuhiro Watsuki wanted this series to be unlike any other shonen, I think the studio directors and producers had other plans. Sure, they kept in the main point and the ultimate theme, but in between those arcs, we were given these light-hearted episodes with our characters doing random things, like Yahiko pretending to be a prince, Kenshin finding a ring with Kaoru thinking it was an engagement ring, puppies, and the gang protecting a performer from a rival performance group trying to take her act down. You see what I mean here? And if you're going to say, didn't you say it was only going to get darker the further you watch it? Yes, but do you want to know what the final arc essentially was? To put it simply, it was a Rurouni Kenshin version of... Indiana Jones. <laughs> Yeah, the gang go on a quest to find a flower that can cure any disease before an evil army from Germany... Oh... ...wants to take it for themselves. Oh my god, this is Indiana Jones. <laughs> Seriously, what is this arc? How does it fit in with the rest of the story? If you're going to tell a dark story about the complications of war and the changing times, you can't muddle it all with anime feller fluff. <laughs> and yet I say all this, but I forgot there was an arc where Kenshin had to fight evil chi warriors who were using the power of feng shui to destroy a city. How the hell did I forget that? I mean, I remember the Kyoto arc, the Jesus arc, the Indiana Jones villains wannabe arc, how can I forget the Feng Shui arc? Oh uh, yeah, probably because it was too stupid to remember. That arc was just... stupid. The anime felt like it was trying to be two different things. A lighthearted shonen anime with a lot of action and drama, but also a lot of political struggle and death. Thankfully, the OVAs in the movie take the structure of Rurouni Kenshin and make it work. Rurouni Kenshin, the motion picture has a different story with a rebel army trying to overthrow the government after everything that had happened to them, but without the shonen fluff the anime had to have. It's a heavy movie with Kenshin trying to find peace between the fighting factions while coming to terms with the soldier he killed many years ago that only led to this fight. This focused narrative while showing the complications of war, power, and pride makes this a pretty damn good movie to me. As for the OVA, I say they take everything Rurouni Kenshin represents and blows the anime out of the water. We have a story with Kenshin while he was a manslayer called Rurouni Kenshin Trust and Betrayal and a sequel to the anime showing the aftermath of Kenshin's journey as a wandering swordsman called Rurouni Kenshin Reflection. And not too long ago, the Kyoto arc with Mikado 
Makoto Shishio was given a retelling in the OVA special Rurouni Kenshin New Kyoto Arc. All three stories are done really well with the narration and theme. Yes, that means they're much darker in comparison, but it's necessary when you're dealing with such a heavy topic. Trust and betrayal was dark and heartbreaking to witness Kenshin's past, while reflection was excruciatingly sad, yet bittersweet to watch as we see a cower in Kenshin's life together up until the very end. These two OVAs alone demonstrate Kenshin's character as a whole, that he is who he is because he wants to atone for the lives he took away in the past, that as long as he is able to walk on this earth, he will continue to lend his services to defend the innocent and peace, with Kaoru always being there to support him no matter how dark and bleak it all seems. As for the new Kyoto arc, it's a more dramatic yet compressed version of the Kyoto arc for the first anime. While it takes away most of the humor, it still captures everything that went down in that chapter, but at the same time, it feels like there's a bit missing in regards to character development. Like, in order to fully appreciate the OVA, you'd have to read the manga or watch the anime. It still is a nice OVA to watch, which unintentionally made me laugh at this part. I have been waiting... ...on a sinking ship where everyone is about to die. No one will interrupt us. Our final battle shall happen here. Really? No, really? Do, do, do you not see what's going on around us? The ship is sinking. Everything is on fire. And if you haven't noticed, there is a fucking sword stabbed right through me. And you want to fight right now? What the fuck? To which he's still able to kick his ass with the sword still stabbed through him and as they're sailing away from the burning ship. So, lesson learned, kids. Don't fuck with Kenshin. He'll still kick your butt with a sword stabbed right through him. I love this. So after watching all 95 episodes, one animated movie, and 8 OVA episodes, was the Rurouni Kenshin experience worth it? Yes. Definitely. Sure, the anime has its problems with the tone issues mixing with the story that they're trying to tell, but it's still an amazing story that needs to be told. They say history is told with the loser's blood, and that those who win are always seen as the good guys. Kenshin's story, however, demonstrates the complications of war and trying to maintain peace when those in power or hungry for power use everything around them to get whatever they want, no matter who they hurt. I'd say if you want the basics of Kenshin's journey and his struggling path to redemption, the OVAs in the movie will do you just fine. But if you want the full experience, I can assure you the anime will have its moments that'll amaze you. And plus, you'll be playing my favorite game as I was watching this, Who's That Voice Actor? Basically, if you watched a lot of late 90s, early 2000s anime, you're bound to recognize a lot of these actors like Wendy Lee, Bo Billingsley, and of course, Steve Bloom. If you want to watch this series yourself, you can watch the whole anime on Netflix and the new Kyoto arc on High Dive, but the other OVAs and the movies are a bit hard to find, so you'll have to use Google to look them up yourself. Given the story and adult theme, this is a heavy series to get through, but I'd say it's worth your time. If you're in the mood for a classic anime with well-thought-out characters, action, and drama, then I'd highly recommend Rurouni Kenshin. Alright, that's another Patreon request down, and still a lot more to go. Yay. So what's next on the Patreon list? F Tales of Memory and Melody, and just in time for the Month of Love. How many episodes are there? <laughs> oh, thank God! Why am I married to this woman? I mean... <laughs> Well, to be fair, I mean, just look at her. Why, look, she may be a bitch, but look at those legs. Damn! I'm the only serious character in this show. That is the joke. Who the hell is he? I'm the Black Swordsman. No, you're f***ing not. How the hell did he get so overpowered? Psh, I'm not overpowered. Oh, no oh, 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 Well, if it ain't my arch nemesis, backstabbing shit bird. There is no need to speak of you all. Then shut the f up and come at me! Are you Jesus Christ? No. Oh my god, you are! You're Jesus Christ! Nani? <laughs> Team 
Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch. Stab it! Welcome to slavery. No thanks. I already had a wife. Go ninja, go ninja, go! 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 I'm gonna cut your heart out with a spoon! Why a spoon, cousin? Why not an axe? Because it's dull, you twit. It'll hurt more. Oh, well then. Bring it on! I'm ready for you! Ow! You're fired. And I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. Now let's see how well you handle it. Now I just need to find my generic love interest. Are you the right one? I guess I could. Are you the right one? I'm like 12. Are you the right one? I'm as useless as a hedgehog in a condom factory. How about you, Tits McGee? It's not like I like you or anything, you idiot baka! Perfect. Hey there, if you like what we do on this channel, be sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell. If you wish to support us financially, we do have a Patreon page with numerous rewards to fit your budget. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at Anime America, and be sure to check out our other channel, Pop Spectrum. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned, Anime America.